They asked me to give a talk. Now, tonight's the night. Allah. You've been very patient. I want to tell you a story. The story of how priests and preachers enter Islam. It happened something like this. My father and I had a business in a mall some years ago. One day dad came to the house. He had a big house in the country and he said, you know son, something amazing. We're going to be doing with a business with a man from Egypt. I said, well that's great. Egypt, that's the land of the pyramids, the Nile River. Cleopatra, all that good stuff. This is exciting, yep. So I said, well, when are we going to meet this guy? He said, yeah, we're going to set it up and we're going to have uh, you know, a chance to get with him coming up. And, oh, and he's a Muslim. I said, a what? A Muslim? No, Dad, those guys, we don't do business with these people. You know, no way. They're terrorists, hijackers, kidnappers. Murders. They don't believe in God. They worship a black box in the desert and they kiss the ground five times a day. We don't need anything to do with no Muslims. My dad said, I want you to meet him. I said, no. He said, yes. I said, I don't want to meet him. He said, you will meet this man. So, well, I can't argue with that. So, all right, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I do it on my terms. Here's what I want to do. I want to come to him on Sunday after church with my Bible and my born-again wife who will be all prayed up. I'll have on my cross and my cap that says, Jesus is Lord. <laughs> and that's what we did. We went to church, heard a big sermon, heard somebody get the Holy Ghost, and somebody else translated what they were saying. I don't know if you know what that means. That means somebody is speaking in tongues. They don't know what they're saying. Blah, 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 blah. And then somebody else translates it for them. And that really happened just like that. And then after that we said, boy, we're charged up. Let's go get this Muslim. We went into the store where my father's place was. And I was ready for this guy. And I expected to see, you know, one of those guys with a big, you know, coat on to the floor and a big, you know, turban on and a long beard and a... <laughs> yeah, never mind. Anyway, <laughs> and a sword. I was expecting like Ayatollah Khomeini or something, you know. Eyebrows that start here and go all the way across, you know, really. Then my dad said, here he is. I said, where? He said, here. I said, this guy? This guy's wearing normal clothes, you know. And he doesn't have a beard. He didn't have any hair at all. He was bald-headed. <laughs> so, this is what a Muslim looks like? He said, yeah. Okay. Shook hands with him. I was surprised. It was warm. He was human, you know. I could feel warmth in that. Okay. So I'll be nice. Hello, how are you? My name is Gavin. What's your name? My name is Muhammad. Okay, Muhammad, very nice to meet you. Uh, by the way, you believe in God? He said, yes. Yeah, but do you believe in the God of Abraham? He said, yeah. Because, see, I had been studying up. I know something about these Muslims. What about Moses? Do you believe in Moses? He said, yeah. Mm-hmm. How about David and Solomon? He said, yeah. But do you believe in the Bible? Do you believe in the Old Testament? He said, yeah. How about the New Testament? He said, yeah. I said, wait a minute. Do you believe in Jesus? He said, yeah. No, I'm telling you, do you believe Jesus is a miracle birth? Yeah. But you don't believe him as the risen Jesus? He said, yeah, he's, he's with God. I said, yeah. Wait a minute. This is going to be easy. This is going to be so easy, yes. So I told my dad, let's do business with this guy. We can convert him, no problem. My dad said, leave him alone. I said, no. Uh, 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 you know. We started doing business. We started traveling together, he and I. 
I began to observe his ways and began to realize that he was a real decent person, a nice person, a fair person. In fact, we would have discussions and I would purposely try to sneak things around in the talk, but he would just be straight and say, okay, whatever, and let it go. Say, hmm, this is gonna be easy. At one point, a friend of mine that has a big cross, he has a huge wooden cross, and he carries it down the street from time to time. He'll go down the freeway, he'll go across the country just so people see him walking along with this big huge cross. They'll stop and say, what is this? And then he'll start to preach to them, because he's a preacher too, you know. He'd give them these little miniature Bibles with just a few verses in it. <coughs> Especially has the verse John 3 16 for God so loved the world, etc. etc. And this man with the cross, I told him, you know, I've found a Muslim. He said, Stop right there. Stay away from those guys. They're very dangerous. I said, Yeah, but I think we can get him, you know. I have some ideas about this. He said, Well, just take it easy. He said, you know, they don't really believe in anything, they're infidels. Okay. Then he had a heart attack and went to the hospital. When I went to visit him in the hospital, I met another man there. This man was a priest, a Catholic priest. And we became friends. When the Catholic priest was released from the hospital, we asked him to come and stay with us. And on the drive out to the country to my dad's house, the priest told me that he knew about Islam quite a bit because he told me Catholic priests have to study all religions, especially they have to study Islam. I said, I didn't know that. He said, yes, we have to know about Islam. He said, these guys, they know about the Bible. They know about the New Testament. They know about the Psalms and they know about Jesus and they know a lot about our religion and their religion and their Quran. I said, really? He said, yeah, take it easy. So, okay. I said, well, they don't, they don't really believe right, do they? He said, you'd be surprised. He said, they really do have a lot going for them. I said, oh, okay. Now I've been warned about these guys. So I started again, trying to give the invitation to this gentleman to jump into our religion. Guess what he said? He said, well, I'll go to your religion if your religion is better than my religion. I said, this is great. Fill up the bathtub, we'll dunk him tonight, make him a Bible, he's good to go. <coughs> but then he threw something at me I wasn't ready for. He said, but you're going to need proof. I said, proof? Religion's not about proof. Religion is about faith. He said, in, is in Islam, we have both. We have proof. And we have faith, both. I said, okay. Are you trying to tell me you can prove there's a God? He said, yes. I said, no, I don't think so. Now look at this. A preacher arguing with somebody who wants to prove there's a God saying, no, there isn't. Isn't proof, that is. And he's saying, yes, there is. Now I decided what we need to do is to gang up on him because I wasn't a match for this guy. You know, you know just one-on-one, -on -one, I need help. My dad's an ordained minister. He read the whole Bible by the time he was 10 years old. He had a certificate for that. My wife was very conversant in the Bible. She had her own Bible. And I felt like the best thing to do gang up on him. So after the meal at night, clear off the table and I'm going to bring my Bible. Dad brought his Bible. My wife has her Bible. Catholic priest, he's ready to go with his and we're really going to give it to this man. But it didn't work like that because my dad has the Masonic Bible which is King James Version. But I had the Revised Standard Version, which is different, doesn't have all the verses that he has. 
My wife has Jimmy Swaggart's Bible, The Good News for Modern Man, and that's another version with weird stuff in it. The Catholic priest has the Bible with 73 books, and our books only have 66 books, and we're arguing with each other, uh-uh, yes, no, not that, this, that, the other, and all the rest of it. We had a problem. How are we going to justify what verses we're talking about when we can't even agree with ourselves? How are we going to convince this man about the Bible? How? Finally, it became obvious we weren't going to ever agree on anything. So I turned to the Muslim and I said, by the way, how many versions of that book of your Koran do you have? Oh, there must be a lot of those too, right? He said, there's only one. A one. And it's in Arabic. And if it's not in Arabic, then it's not the Quran because Quran is recitation. Recitation. It's what you recite. And he recited some things for us and I was amazed. He knew it in the original language. I had not seen anything like this before. A lot of people who look at Islam realize how powerful it is to have the original in Arabic language. They don't realize that. Because when you compare to other religions, they don't have their original books anymore. They have copies, translations, pieces of this and that, people's opinions, books written about it. For instance, if a person wrote a book today about the Quran, and 2,000 years from now somebody said, well, that is the Quran, that'd be a joke, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be a joke? Well, that's pretty much what they got. Somebody writing about it. But it's not the speech of Allah. Next, we got off the subject because I see I'm not going anywhere with that. Next, another night. We're going to talk about what we believe. Because, after all, Christianity is the easiest religion in the world. There isn't anything easier than Christianity. You just say the magic words, you don't have to pray. You don't have to fast. You don't have to make hajj. You don't have to pay zakah. You don't have to grow a beard. You don't have to wear a hijab. You don't have to do anything. Except hope that it's going to work. <laughs> you got to hope that God is really going to punish somebody else for your sins so you don't get punished. Not too likely, is it? So, I decided to talk about this. In explaining him about salvation, we came to a new su uh, subject. He said, how do you get saved? What will save you from going to hell? I said, well, that's what Christianity is best at. We have the perfect salvation. We have the grace. He said, how does it work? I said, well, the grace works like this. God can't forgive sins. So he sends his son to die for everybody's sin. He said, why can't God forgive sin? Well, I don't know how that works. He said, and if he can't forgive sin, then how come after he kills his son, he can forgive sins? I don't know how that works either. He said, and you're guilty, but his son is innocent. So where in history do we find it that it's good that innocent people have to be killed for the sake of the guilty ones? Well, I don't know how that works either. So we had a problem with that one. Especially when you consider if your child is bad, really bad, maybe he did something to the cat, Maybe he threw stuff out of the refrigerator, ran around the house in a skateboard, broke the television set, broke some windows, 
Maybe let the car roll out into the street and get hit by the trash truck. <laughs> so you come home and you say, look what he did. But I can't forgive him. So I've got my other child over here that didn't do anything at all. So I'll beat him up. <laughs> no, I'll kill him. The innocent one. People would put that man in the insane asylum, wouldn't they? They'll lock that man up for that, right? Society won't accept that, so why does religion accept it? And if you accept that, then it should be okay for people to kill their innocent children. But Islam forbid the killing of innocent children. They forbid it because some of the ignorant Arabs used to do that. Kill their innocent children, especially their daughters. Islam forbids killing of the innocent. Whoops. Well, I had to stop on that one. Let's back off of that. Well, forget about the Bible. Forget about the salvation. That doesn't work. He said, especially when you talk about salvation in Islam, we also say what you say. You say nobody is saved except by grace. That was everything we knew in Texas. I heard that so many preachers said, nobody is saved except by grace. He said the word for grace in Arabic is Rahma. And the Quran begins with Rahma. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Yes? How many times Allah says Ar Rahman or Rahim, Ar Rahman or Rahim throughout the Quran? Too many times. So many times. Allah talks about Rahma. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, talked about Allah's Rahma. So much Rahmah. One of the hadiths he talks about that Allah has 100 parts of Rahmah. And one part of the 100 was used for all of mankind and all of his dunya. One part. All the mercy you ever saw or ever imagined since the beginning to the end is one part of Allah's Rahmah. The other 99 parts is waiting for the believers on the day of judgment. And the Prophet said, peace be upon him, nobody is saved except by this Rahmah. They said, even you, Rasulullah. He said, even me. So who has the grace? Okay, let's get off of that subject. I'm thinking, we'll move to something else. He says, can you talk to me about your belief in God? What do you believe about God? Which God is one. He said, do you have Trinity? Yes, God is three. He said, I thought you said he's one. He is one and three. He said, how does that work? Because uh, God can do anything? Okay, let me get back to you. So I go to my friend with the cross. Remember him? He's out of the hospital. I go to him. I start to tell him the problem I'm having with the Muslims. He said, stay away from him. I told you. I said, yeah, but they believe in Jesus was a miracle birth and Jesus was, you know, doing miracles and Jesus is with God. He's coming back. He said, but they don't believe in the cross. They don't believe in the salvation. I said, well, yeah, but he said, stop, stay away from him. I said, all I have to do is explain the Trinity. And I'm sure I'll get him then. But how can I explain that one equals three? He said, no, 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 no. Look like an apple. The apple has a skin. Inside of the skin is the meat and inside of that is the seeds. Three things. One apple. Same way. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. One God. <laughs> Father, Son, Holy Ghost. One God. Got it. Okay. Got it. So I go back and I'm ready. <laughs> Clear off all the dishes after supper. Sit down. My father, myself, my wife, the priest and the Muslim. <laughs> Pull out the apple. You see this apple? Has a skin. Inside is the meat and inside of that is the seeds. He said, yeah, there's about six or eight seeds in there. What is that equal? <laughs> yeah. Okay. He said in Looks like a worm crawling through it too. That could be four or five gods here. 
So, all right, let me get back to you. I'm going to go back to the guy with the cross the next day. I said, okay. The apple didn't work. He said, stay away from this guy. I said, the apple didn't work. I told him what happened. He said, it's not, forget about the apple. I said, okay, I forgot about it. It's like an egg. God is like an egg. He said, the egg is a shell. Inside of the shell is the white. Inside of the white is the yellow. Three things, one egg. Said, yes. <laughs> now I'm ready. Go back. Clear the table. Sit down. Here we go. <laughs> See this egg? Yeah, it's a pretty big egg. <laughs> what if it's a double yolk? <laughs> God just becomes four. Uh, and what if it's rotten? Ooh. Yeah, okay, forget about that. A few days later, I was in a parking lot. Some people talking to me. I was preaching as usual. And a fella said to me, uh, what's the problem? I was telling him some difficulties with these Muslims. I said, I'm trying to explain the Trinity to this guy and I just can't seem to catch it. He said, don't you know how to do it? You're a preacher, you ought to know that. I said, yeah, I ought to, but I don't have it. He said, look, see me, I'm one person. I said, yes, you are. You see my wife right there? I said, yeah, she's one person. Yes, she is. You see my son right there? Yes, he's one person. They're one, one, one. But all together, we're a family of three. One family. It's the family of God. I said, that's it. Here we go. But on the way back, I got to thinking about it. I said, let me try to process this before I get there and wind up with apple or egg on my face. <laughs> I said, uh, okay. The father, the mother, the son. What if they have another kid? What if they have talam, twins? What if they get divorced? Talak. Because in Texas, when you get divorced, the woman, she gets the house, the car, the savings, the bank account, the retirement, the IRS, everything. And your computer and all your email. I don't want a God that could lose his email. I'm trying to think how I'm going to explain this. So I sat down at the table that night and I didn't have a clue, but we're going to try something. I'm trying to explain. The Bible said, the Bible said, actually the Bible said God is one. <laughs> Everywhere I look in the Bible it says God is one, 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 one. There's nothing except ones throughout the whole Bible. There's no trinity, there's no two, there's no three. There's just one God. Say, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. That's in the book of Deuteronomy and it's in the book of Mark. That means the Old Testament and the New Testament both. The Jews and the Christians are ordered to believe that God is one. Like this. Besides, who wants a God with a worm in it? Or a God that can be rotten or a God that gets a divorce. So we asked the Muslim, what do you guys say about God? Look what he said. A'udhu billahi min shaitani rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakuluhu kufuwan ahad. Say he is Allah, the uniquely one, the eternal. He is not the father of anything. He's not the son of anything. He doesn't compare to anything. And he's unique. One. I had said, wow. That sounds like what I believe anyway. Okay, we can go with that. Now along the way through all of this, 
all of us are having our own questions and our, our own discussions individually with this man from Egypt. The Catholic priest asked him one day, can I go to your church with you? His temple, his mosque. He said, sure, come on. They were gone for a while. They got back a little later. We took the priest aside and we said, did you go in there? Yeah. Did you see them? Yeah. What do they do? <laughs> do they like slaughter little animals or anything like that or, you know? He said, no, actually, uh, they stand there like monks do. Uh, you know, in monks in a monastery, they stand for hours praying. He said, that's what they do. They just stand there and pray. And then they bow and they do something that only the high priest gets to do, which is to put a sajda or prostration. I said, really? He said, yeah. Uh, and then what? And then they leave. That's it? Yeah. Okay. What kind of music do they have? So they don't have any music. How in the world do you worship God without music? I was a music minister. Hello. So I went to my friend from Egypt. I said, excuse me. Is it true you guys don't have any music in your mosques? He said, that's true. How many mosques are in the world? He said, millions. I said, millions. Hmm. They all have electricity? He said, yeah. Hmm. Because I sell electric pianos, organs. I was thinking, hmm. I could, go by, I could get rich. This is a good idea. Do you think they'd be interested in any music? He said, you could try. <laughs> but I doubt it. <laughs> you boy. <laughs> See, he didn't want to make anything just like haram, haram, haram. Just let you get in the door. First thing for first. La ilaha illallah. And he kept that first no matter what we brought up. No matter what was the subject. He get it back to La ilaha illallah. A few days more go by. The Catholic priest says, can I go again with you? He said, sure. He said, I found such peace there. I just want to go there again and feel that feeling again. So they left. And they didn't come back. They didn't come back. And it was so late at night. And they finally, finally drove up the old country road out there. And when they got out of the car, right away I recognized the Muslim, you know. But who was this guy with him? Had on a white kufiya, a long white robe. So that's the priest? <laughs> what happened to you? Pete, did you become a Muslim? He said, Ashhadu wa la ilaha illallah, said Muhammad Rasulullah. I was shocked. I considered this to be the biggest part of the story because this man had dedicated his entire life to the Lord. He had completely given up all worldly things so that he could be a priest. He could not get married. He could not have children. He cannot do this and that and so and so. They don't even gamble. They don't do, they don't do anything. They just pray. So, wow. You've given all that up? He said, I'm giving up nothing. I'm gaining. I'm going, really? He said, this is the right way. He said, I know it is. So let me get my cameras out. We used to have a television show. I get my camera out, set it on a tripod, get the lights hooked up, put the microphones in. You guys know how long that takes. We get it all together. Guess what? <laughs> the priest was asleep. <laughs> so, well. So I went upstairs. I want to tell my wife. I'm still excited. I can't believe it. A priest entered Islam today. Can you believe that? A priest, a Catholic priest became a Muslim, I'm telling her. She said, I want to get a divorce. I go, huh? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is a different subject here. What happened? She said, 
I've had it, I've been listening, talking, we were thinking about what's going on around here. I see where you're going, I know where I want to go, and I say, and a Muslim cannot be married to a Christian. We heard him say that, a Muslim can't be married to a Christian, so I want a divorce. I said, I'm not going to become no Muslim, take it easy. Uh, did I say I want to be one of them guys? No, I didn't say that. Farthest thing from my mind, forget about that, let's go back to normal. And besides, he said that a Christian woman couldn't be married to a Muslim. A, a Muslim uh, woman can't be married to a Christian man, you see. So if I became a Muslim, it would be all right for you to be a Christian. It's just that a Muslim woman can't be married to the Christian or Jew or anything else. She said, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I want to become a Muslim. <laughs> okay, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> okay, it's time to go into a save mode. There's what's called plan B. <clears throat> By the way, there's some good news here. I too would like to be a Muslim. She said, what? I said, no, really. I want to do, but I didn't know how to tell you, so I also want to be a Muslim. So that's it, okay? She said, I don't believe you. <laughs> I said, no, I, I, really, I, I just didn't know how to tell you. I didn't know what to say in front of dad, but hey, you know, now that it's all out, I'm ready to be a Muslim. Da, 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 da. <laughs> she said, you're a liar. I said, how can you say that? She said, you're either lying right now or you were lying five minutes ago when you said you didn't want to be a Muslim. Mm, got me there, all right. <laughs> yep, that's pretty true. <laughs> she said, get out. Well, that's that, you know. I'm, not, I'm going down the steps and I'm thinking, you know, all my life, everything is just flashing in front of me. My wife, my kids, my... Wait a minute, this is my father's house. How am I getting thrown out of here? <laughs> so I go down. I wake up my friend from Egypt. I said, come outside. You and me, we got to talk. He said, what's the matter? I said, we got to go outside. Oh, yeah. We go outside. And I begin to tell him my whole life story, everything. I don't know why I had to talk to somebody. So we walked up and down those country roads until the sun started to rise for Fajr. He was so patient. He listened so intently. And by the way, that wasn't the only time. This man was always ready to listen to my problems long after I got into Islam. But on this particular occasion, I really needed him to listen. As the sun started to rise and we saw the first little bit of orange, I told him, you better go pray your fudger and I got to figure out what to do. So I snuck off by myself. I found a big piece of board with a shelter over it and I put it down. There's something in the Bible about making a booth to pray to the Lord, okay? I don't know if you knew about that. It's called the booth and they set it up. I tried to face it toward what I figure is the east about the direction he's aiming himself and I put my head on the ground because I said if it works for those Muslim guys maybe it'll work for me and with my head on the ground I said these words only oh God if you're there guide me and when I raised up my head I understood everything it was in me where the problem was. It's not out there, it's in here. And not until you begin to deal with this in here will you ever be able to get right with what's out here. Because when this is not right, your connection to him is not right, and when that's not right, ain't nothing right. I had to become a Muslim, and I had to tell the truth, and I had to admit there could only be one God. Not two, not three. And God can forgive sin if he wants to. And he doesn't need to kill somebody else to get it done. In fact, I had to be responsible for my own sins. And that's the hardest part about changing out of Christianity to Islam. 
is to come to grips with the fact that you have to stand up and pay for what you did. You can't charge it to somebody else's American Express card. <laughs> so that was it for me. I knew I had to go in. So I went in and I made a bath and I came downstairs and I was ready. And I stood there in front of my friend from Egypt and the brand new Muslim, the ex-priest, and I said these words, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu Muhammad Rasulullah. A few minutes later, here came my wife right behind me, said the same thing. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu Muhammad Rasulullah. Without giving you the whole story tonight, I will tell you some weeks and months went by, but my father also said the same thing. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah and just before she died my stepmother said I've been listening to you guys for all these years and I know that Jesus can't be a God or a son of a God there can only be one God Muhammad's his messenger Allahu Akbar she died a few months after that Alhamdulillah at the age of about 86 amazing isn't it isn't it amazing how Allah works Yesterday we gave shahada to a man 63 years old. This year, in the spring of this year, we gave shahada to a woman who was 99. And all of her children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, alhamdulillah, are Muslim. All of them, alhamdulillah, all Americans, by the way. It's amazing, isn't it? I've seen so many people enter Islam and every time they do, I cry. I cry and they cry and it feels good to know that there is this Rahmah from Allah that he will bring even the priests and the preachers of other religions to Islam. Did you know that people who are pundits from the Indian religion of Hinduism, I've seen them come in Islam. Yes. Have you heard of the Brahmin caste of the Hindus? The one who is making so much money selling CDs for Bollywood from India. A woman named, uh, I think her name was, uh, they used to call her Charmin or something like that. She had this big company doing millions of CDs for Bollywood. She had a dream one night. A vision, she said it was like being wide awake. I was in a store, she said, and I was looking at a book, and there was a special book in this store, and I knew I had to buy this book. If I ever see this book, I have to buy it. Her driver had taken her to some store. She was going to go in to do something. She realized, this is the store, and this is the book. There it is. She started screaming, this is a book of my dream. I have to buy it. The vendor there said, well, then buy it. <laughs> so she bought it and went home and read it. Guess what the book was? You're right. Translation of Quran. She said, because this is from my dream, I'm going to read it. And I'm going to believe it. And I'm going to accept it. And she did. She became Muslim. Alhamdulillah. By the way, her driver had been driving for her for over seven years. Then all of a sudden, she found out he was Muslim. He never told her. She never knew. She thought he was a Hindu. The one who sold her the book was a Muslim. Didn't tell her that she was buying Quran, just said, give me the money. <laughs> Imagine that. I'm wondering how many opportunities we miss every day. Because that lady came up to me as a brand new Muslim and she said to me, I would like to take one of your tapes and make CDs out of it. I said, go ahead and have a good time. She did. She's made over 600,000 of them and distributed all over the United States. Many people came to Islam. Maybe some of you know about that because of her effort, not mine. We've done hundreds of thousands of these CDs and we see the result of it all the time. But you know something? You, you don't have to just sit here and listen to the story. You can be part of this story. It's real easy. You can go to our website islamtomorrow.com our other website with the CDs are right there for you free I don't know if anybody else came and offered you something for free 
Maybe they did. But the website's there and it's free. You go to islamyesterday.com and download as many as those CDs as you'd like. Make copies of them and give them out to all the people. And let's find out how many more people will hear this message and say, Ashhadu la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu Muhammad Rasulullah. I'll give you a little free entertainment. <clears throat> it goes something like this. Uh, you know, I was in Saudi Arabia recently, and I found, you know, everybody's very style conscious. I don't know why, but, you know, we think about Muslims should be like, the last thing in your mind is worrying about how your clothes look and things like that, but people of the Gulf, they're just like everybody else. They want to look nice, show off, and so that's why I'm wearing this outfit tonight. This bisht, as they call it, you see it, how it fits like this? Now I'm going to take this off and show you. Watch closely. See this? This is called what? Huh? Ghutra? Now you can put the eagle, and this is real classy. But for the poor guy, he doesn't have eagle. He can just go like this. Huh? Huh? It's good? He can also wrap around with it like this. Is that good? <laughs> like it? Huh. Thank you. I got excited, huh? Okay, now, see this? Looks good, huh? It's talent, man. But then what about the, the kids? They don't want to, that's old man stuff. So the kid said, you know what, Dad? Just let me have one of these. <laughs> And when it's time for Salah, it's easy. Mafi Mushkila. Right? That's funny, huh? By the way, that's why I wore this all night long. I was getting tired of wearing this anyway. We flew in here today from Melbourne, and I guarantee you I didn't wear this on the airplane. <laughs> but tomorrow, inshallah, when I leave, I can imagine if I put all this stuff on and that and get in the airplane, right? Every time I sneeze, they're going to go, oh. <laughs> I know it's bad. Muslims shouldn't do it. But I've always had this idea. What if you had a briefcase, just leave it in the airport and go, what's that? <laughs> That'd be all right, I'll tell you. Well, I've had a lot of fun here in the land down under. I got to tell you that it's been a lot of fun. As we say, it's been a real hoot. And uh, <laughs> no worries. Good day, mate. Salaamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. One Islam Productions, an Islamic film studio established in Australia, is dedicated to producing films for all Muslims. Just some of the films by One Islam Productions. Children's programs, Islam for Me, We Remember Allah, Storytime and more. Educational films, Pray As You Have and Seen Me Pray, to lead Words, pray. Ramadan, Renewal Next. of Faith. Documentaries. We at One Islam Productions believe that Islam is precious and deserves to be presented in only the highest quality. Visit us at www.oneislam.net for more information. One Islam Productions, a film production company run by Muslims for Muslims.